Listen, it takes a special kind of cynic to not be impressed by Canada's economic performance in 2017. Before looking forward to 2018, let's take a quick look back at the year that was. Canada's economy has added jobs for 12 months in a row. We haven't seen a streak like that in this country in nearly a decade. Not just any kind of jobs, though. Nearly half a million full-time jobs have been created so far this year. The unemployment rate is at 5.9%. That's the lowest it's been since the darkest days of the global financial crisis in 2008. Canada's economic growth is on pace to lead the G7. The Bank of Canada raised its key benchmark interest rate twice it's a big vote of confidence from the country's central bank. And yet, there are things that keep its governor, Stephen Polaz, up at night. I had the chance to speak with Governor Polaz in an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview earlier today. Here's the first part of our conversation. Governor, welcome back to the show. Delighted. Nice to see you. Everyone else has begun this year, or ended this year, begin, set us up for next year with the economy's doing great, the markets are going like gangbusters, jobs are being added, and you come in to throw cold water on the whole thing. You, you, you found stuff that keeps you up at night even as the economy's doing so well. So that's a bit unfair, because <laughs> I did talk about... You uh, talked about how well it's how doing. We, we've had a great year, and uh, you know, since I became governor, it's really the first really good year. And uh, all the rest, we've been just playing defense, right. you know. So uh, it's been great to see things coming together, and our confidence is increasing. There are still some leftover things to do, you know. So uh, we don't want people to forget those things and just assume everything's perfect, because it's not. How, how important is that part of your job, though, to, to go and, and look for where the risk is? Because I think we could be blinded by it with everything that is going so well right now. Well, I think it's, it's, it's really how I think of monetary policy. It's, uh, most people think of it as kind of like an engineering exercise when you know what right. the economy is doing. You just tweak like this and everything's perfect. Uh, but in reality, we don't know enough to be able to do that. And if you take that uncertainty into your policy making instead of just assuming it away, which is what the previous uh, example does, then you start thinking of it more as a risk management exercise. Right. And so which risk is worst that I face and how do I protect against that? Which risk would actually be good? In which case, I'll let that go if it happens. As you said, this is the first good year you've had since, since your tenure began. It, has the role changed as the economy has started to, to climb back out again? Were you then looking for sort of signs of good in the economy to sort of tell us, listen, it's going to get better in a couple quarters down the road, and now it's shifted a little bit? You know, we, we went through a phase uh, when I first came, which we ended up calling serial disappointment right. because we had one step forward and then another step back and nothing seemed to go in a nice trend. And then uh, the oil shock hit. And of course, this was, at that time, we were actually getting quite encouraged and, and boom, oil price shock meant a two-year delay in that right. process of getting back to where we belong. And so when I look at that, there's never really been a period that I could call typical. You know, every, every period has been unique. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a phase in history which is unique. We hope it stays unique because it's a post-crisis economy where we still have legacy, legacy effects throughout our economy and much even bigger ones uh, in other economies. So nothing is as it usually is, is done. Uh, you, you said in the speech that the economy is oper operating near its capacity, growth is forecast to run above potential, and yet yeah. at the same time, there remains slack in the labor market, and that that poses a downside risk to risk inflation. I is that like having two opposing thoughts in your head at the same time? And is that a, a big part of it, is trying to balance out yeah. where the good is and where the bad is? Well, this is what I mean by risk management. So for us, we say, you know, by conventional measures, the economy is running basically at full, full steam. Uh, but we can see in the labor market there is there's excess capacity there. This is a sort of divergence that happens when you have slow cycles like we've had. Normally those things would be perfectly correlated with each other. Right. And so right now they aren't. So what we want is the economy to grow hotter for a while so that it uses up that excess capacity that's still in the labor market. And the way that will happen is companies will invest more, create new capacity with more people and raise our level of GDP throughout, okay? So that's the process, what I call the sweet spot, that we're watching unfold now. 
and it could last a year or something. The U.S. economy, the last 18 months or so, has been in that same place. And, I, I mean, you mentioned your three concerns were cyber uh, threats, uh, what was the other one, house and, and housing prices and indebtedness, uh, and then, of course, job concerns for the job market for young people. Yes. Do all of those sort of rotate around those, the, you know, business investment and exports and how we as an economy are dealing with those two core things? Well, yeah, some some do. Uh, uh, cyber, I think, is an independent uh, thing, which is not really dependent on the the cycle or anything like that. Right. And, and but the other two are actually longer term issues. So they're they, you know what we hope is that those folks who are young who have dropped out of the workforce, so they're not counted at right. the unemployment rate today, uh, will return. You know, as the conditions continue to improve. And we, the last month we saw some signs of that. So sure. so we're encouraged by that and. You know, there are like 4% of them that uh, were in the workforce before and aren't there now. Uh, in terms of the household debt thing, uh, a governor can't give a speech without talking about that because right. it's our number one concern. And uh, the fact is we've accumulated all that in the post-crisis period. Um, it was a byproduct of the monetary policy we followed. We understand all that. And so what we want to do is make sure that we don't do something abrupt or in some way put, put our, our future outlook in danger by underestimating how important that is. It's important in two ways. If interest rates are higher today, it has a different effect because of the level of debt. But secondly, the, the vulnerability is there, so that if there were a shock like we had in 2008, today the effects would be much larger right. on the economy. That's a magnifying effect. And so that vulnerability becomes an actual risk if some, some, uh, some shock hits. And so what we want is the economy to become more resilient, more sustainable through time, hence the changes to the mortgage rules, et cetera. And really quickly on, on just sort of the direction of things, you're sounding a cautionary tone. The U.S. is pushing ahead really quickly and plans to have a number of hikes over the next years. I think they're going to be up 3.1% at 3.1% by 2020. Can we afford to take that cautionary stance as we see a divergence in interest rates in the U.S.? Well, it's very important that uh, we have an independent monetary policy. Our inflation targets are our inflation targets. And so the witness that uh, back in 2015, when the oil price shock was really having its effect on the economy, we cut rates twice that year while the right. Fed raised rates. So that's proof that we can have an independent policy. Uh, because of that oil shock, we're a year or two behind the U.S. in the cycle. And so we have some more time in front of us. Uh, and so I think we can have our independent policy while the Fed goes about its business. The explosion in the value of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin has been nothing short of spectacular. Some call it the biggest bubble we've seen in generations. Others say this is the future of money. Well, Bitcoin has shot up more than 2,000% in the past year. For many, that fear of missing out is crippling. Some investors are using credit cards, even tapping into their mortgages to get in on the action. Just yesterday, Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen called it a highly speculative asset and not a real currency. But let's look beyond the mania for a moment. Even some of the most ardent bears think the technology that underpins Bitcoin has immense potential. That's called the blockchain technology. And the Bank of Canada is looking into its potential uses. In the second part of my broadcast exclusive conversation with Bank of Canada Governor Stephen Polaz, we delved into the strange new world of cryptocurrencies, their benefits, and the challenges they pose. I can't have you after a speech like that and not talk about Bitcoin. Your line in it that stood out to me was, buying these things means buying risk, which makes it closer to gambling than investing. Those are bold words. Everybody loves Bitcoin right now. Yes. Uh, but I have no idea, I don't know if you do, of what value, uh, intrinsic value it right. might have. So I don't want to comment on that because I just don't know. Uh, all I know is right now the chart looks like the left-hand side of an Eiffel Tower, and that's pretty rare in the financial business. So I think uh, everyone would agree that it's a risky, a risky uh, thing to buy at this moment. But okay, if, if that's what you're into, just read the fine print. And I, I mean, you can read the fine print now because until recently it was just individuals trading bitcoins and if they were to lose it they'd lose it no big deal now we've got into a place where you have futures markets and the potential at least for institutional money to get in there mutual funds pension funds stuff like that that carries a more systemic and more endemic risk how do we adjust to that and what are the concerns from a central bank's perspective of especially in light of 2008 and cds's and cdo's and mbs's uh of things that we didn't understand uh what is the importance of making sure that we do read the fine print and understand what's at risk well, I think individuals obviously have to make sure they understand that it's, it's money they're playing with and that, that money 
could be lost, but uh, I think more importantly from, from a system-wide point of view, uh, some sort of a, a mania or a, a, a run like this uh, can take you in directions that are quite hard to predict, and, and the, the fallout, should it do, do experience a correction, is quite hard to predict. I go back to when we had the tech mania, and which I know you remember well, uh, the good news is that when it did flatten out, uh, it did not have a widespread effect. It right. was pretty well, pretty narrowly focused. And so I have the sense that, you know, we're kind of in a situation like that and it's even narrower uh, for now. Uh, but the uh, new ability to access this thing and, you know, possibly entering even the retail space, you know, that's right. the sort of thing that makes me uncomfortable because it just seems to be moving too quickly for people to understand it well. And from a regulatory perspective, do we really need to separate, separate out what is blockchain and how and where it can be used versus what is Bitcoin and a cryptocurrency and how it can be used? Absolutely. Uh, the, the blockchain concept. Uh, has a, a, a great deal in it, and that's the sort of thing that can add efficiency to many types of transactions. So at the bank, in fact, Bank of Canada, we did the Project Jasper right. to understand how that might work in a wholesale payment system amongst our financial institutions. And there weren't obvious advantages over our current system, but we, at least we know it works. Okay, so, and there you don't have to have everybody, you know, you only have so many actors, so it's not so hard Correct. to have a network with those blockchains distributed, okay, the distributed ledger. In the uh, retail space, it's much harder to imagine everybody having their distributed ledger in their pocket. Right. That's, that's a lot of computing power. So I think we're a ways away from this becoming a uh, true reality, and they're not currencies, they're not money. Uh, people need to remember that, even though they call them that. Right. Yeah. Though, I, I mean, I, I'm writing a piece on it now, and I came across a stat that in 1850, there were something like 8,000 currencies in yep. the U.S. This can very quickly and very, it has great potential to become money. And you've even explored the possibility of, of a central bank, maybe yours, issuing some kind of digital currency in some hypothetical future. Yes. Yeah, so uh, all central banks are studying this uh, quite naturally. And uh, the currency that you have in your pocket is pretty special, okay? That's the one thing that is absolutely certain to give you finality of payment. We call that a public good. It's like, you know, the railway or the, or the roads that you drive on. Well, uh, other forms of payment don't have that same characteristic. There's some risk. Perhaps your, your card gets compromised or what have you. So you have hassles, what have you. So it's not perfect. But currency? Now, if that's something we have to do, that's our job. And if people years from now insist that, well, I want my currency to be in digital form, otherwise I won't use it. In other words, currency would right. be falling. That's the kind of thing that would cause a central bank to say, yes, okay, we should. We should but issue. would that have been a failure of a central bank to, to ensure the sort of validity and, and ongoing usefulness of a, of a currency, of a dollar, of a fiat currency? I don't think so. I think, I think what, what matters is that you can still use cash right. for that purpose, if that's the certainty you wish. And you referred to the United States back when there were a lot of currencies. That's the, called the free banking era. Right. And the free banking era was not a stable financial era. No. Okay, by even a stretch. All right. And so what we need to do is make sure that along the way we understand exactly what the system needs and the central banks will provide it. But that's something that we can continue to study for now. Indeed we can. I'm going to have to leave it there. Stephen Polis, thanks for making the time. Oh, it was a pleasure. It. Great to see you. Thanks, Peter.